evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's SIF 45 Streams Happy Hour, which is sponsored by Great Lakes Brewing Company. I am Patrick Shepard, the Associate Director of the Cleveland International Film Festival, and our friends at Great Lakes Brewing Company encourage you to put your phone down during this happy hour and consider replacing it with a fresh Great Lakes uh, beer like this Conway's Irish Ale. First off, I'd like to introduce Kelly Parker from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who will be interpreting for us during the first half of our program, <clears throat> excuse me, tonight. Thank you so much for being here. And before we kick off tonight's first Q&A segment, SIF Executive Director Marcy Goodman will present this year's Dream Catcher Award. Hello, Marcy. Thank you, Patrick. Oh, sorry. Dream Catcher Cele sorry, oh, excuse me. I'm gonna start all over. I'm gonna say thank you, Patrick. Dreamcatcher is the Cleveland International Film Festival's program and award established in 2019 to honor the life and memory of David K. Ream, a beloved and long serving SIF trustee who died very suddenly in December, 2017 at the age of 68. An indexer by profession, a master of puns by choice and a true Renaissance man at heart, Dave loved Cleveland and everything about it. And he was everywhere, including political events, LGBTQ plus gatherings, and arts happenings, especially SIF. Dreamcatcher celebrates Dave and LGBTQ plus artists by recognizing an LGBTQ plus filmmaker at the festival. And we are overjoyed to honor Ohio's own Todd Stevens as this year's Dreamcatcher program participant an award recipient. Born and raised in Sandusky, Ohio, Todd is a film writer, producer, and director who is currently a professor of film at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. Three of Todd's films make up his Ohio trilogy and we are screening them at the festival. All shot and set in Ohio, they are Edge of 17, which played at the 23rd SIF in 1999, Gypsy 83, and Swan Song. In addition to sharing his trilogy of films with our festival, Todd is sharing his passion for and with our LGBTQ plus community, as well as our film and student communities. Todd's virtual itinerary has taken him to a round table with other LGBTQ plus filmmakers in the festival, the Lambda Gender Sexuality Alliance at Cuyahoga Community College, the Greater Cleveland Film Commission, the LGBT Center at Case Western Reserve University, Sandusky High School, Crowbar Sandusky, the West 117 Foundation, and of course, this happy hour. Thank you, Todd, for all that you have given to SIF 45 Streams and to our community. And now we get to give something to you. Dreamcatcher includes a $5,000 cash award to support your future work. And there is a Pierre's ice cream party pack, which will be delivered to your front door. The award itself is this amazing string artwork by local artist, Karen Bender, which will also be coming your way. The word dream in Dreamcatcher comes from Dave's name, D. Ream. And I think Dave would have been so happy and so proud in this moment. Congratulations, Todd, on your award. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank everyone at the Cleveland International Film Festival. Thank you, Marcy, Mallory. Thank you, Patrick, and my buddy Deirdre. Um, I'm so honored to receive this award tonight uh, in memory of David Ream. Um, during the making of Swan Song, I really felt the spirits of the lives that I was paying homage to in my film. And uh, I can feel them again right now. And I know David is out there too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Todd. Um, you're staying on screen and we're gonna go right back to Patrick. Great. Yeah, Todd, and I, I've, I've shared this with you offline, but your first film, Edge of 17, was so meaningful to me. Uh, my first festival working was the 23rd Cleveland International Film Festival in 1999. And that's when Edge, Edge of 17 screened and it, 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 it evolved my love for film festivals and uh, it, it definitely uh, helped 
my coming out process, which I was more or less done by then, but it was, it, it really echoed a lot of what I went through. So just thank you so much for all of your incredible work. Thank so you. each night of the festival, our filmmakers and guests answer your questions about their films. If you're watching live and you'd like to ask a question, just use the YouTube chat feature over on the right hand side. Our moderators will ask selected questions to filmmakers and guests. On tonight's happy hour, we'll be joined by guests, uh, including Swan Song, obviously, and P.S. Burn This Letter, Please. And we're going to start our first segment uh, with our moderator, who I'm told is the tallest drag queen in the great state of Ohio and has been dubbed the giant redwood of drag, selected by Cleveland Magazine as one of Cleveland's most interesting people in 2021. And I will add that she uh, that was alongside SIF Artistic Mal uh, Director Mallory Martin. And so here it is, Veranda Lanai, welcome. Hi, Hi everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick, so much for, uh, for me being on here. Hello, darlings, my name is Veranda Lanai. I am Cleveland's very own sparkling skyscraper. Um, alongside producing shows, Drag Queen Story Hour, um, and selling real estate, um, I currently serve on the board of directors of the West 117 Foundation. But enough about me. We're here to talk with our super special guest, Todd Stevens. Yay! Um, you know, you are the man behind Swan Song, uh, Gypsy 83, and Edge of 17. Oh my gosh, amazing, amazing films. Um, yeah. So why don't we get started? Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Wow. Um, so Swan Song, amazing. Um, Pat Pitsenbarger, Mr. Pat. Okay. I mean, such an incredible and sure to become iconic character. Um, how did you, did, you know, how did you get to know the real, did you know the real Dr. Pat or um, and what was your experience with this fabulous creature? Um, I never really knew Pat very well. Um, I, 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 would, I would sort of, I remember being a, a, a little kid in Sandusky and I would see this fabulous sort of peacock, you know, like sashaying around downtown with a velvet uh, fedora and um, feather boa and he, he had rings on every finger and it's like this was like in the 70s you know so I mean this person was really living his himself and um, I, I always uh, was inspired by and sort of fascinated by by Pat and when I turned 17 I got up the nerve to go to our local gay bar, which actually was called the Universal Fruit and Nut Company, which is like the best gay bar in the history of the world. No offense to anyone else. Absolutely. Um, but um, when I, you know, I was shivering and I, you know, it's like open the door and um, and something sparkling was, you know, kind of shimmering in the in the distance. And I turned in and there was Pat, you know, wearing like a sequined um, pantsuit. And it all connected, you know. Here was this man that I had seen, you know, as a kid, like growing up, and and he was me, you know. Like I mean, I I, I felt like I always looked up to him because he he always had the courage to be himself at a time when that wasn't so easy to do. So, um, but not long after that, I moved away to New York, and you know, I would come home for the holidays at the. Um, New Year's Eve, Pat would come out and she was like all decked out. And, you know, it was just, but, but Pat was always a little, I mean, I met him a few times. I got to know um, his lover, David, um, a bit, but um, I never really knew Pat very well. So uh, that, that's, that's a regret of mine, but I've gotten to know him through his family and his friends. I did a lot of um, research, you know, with them uh, before I wrote the film. So. Wow, I mean, I just just to be able to see that um, that visage of Mr. Pat would have been phenomenal. Yeah, um, that that's so crazy. Um, you know, the culture has shifted so much on LGBT rights and visibility um, since your first Ohio trilogy film, Edge of Seventeen, came out in 1998. Um, I can only imagine making these films that featured gay themes and characters and funding those films was 
really a different experience then versus now. Um, you know, how have things changed for you as a filmmaker over the last couple of decades um, since those shifts have happened? It's still hard to find money for stories like this, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, um, this was a bit of a challenge to get finance because it wasn't about, you know, two young people, you know, having kissing, having sex scenes, all that kind of stuff, you know, so or whatever, you know, whatever it is. But it's like it's more challenging to make movies about senior citizens um, in terms of financing it. Um, the, the budget for Swan Song was less than the budgets for uh, my other two films that you mentioned, believe it or not. Um, and it was really um, due to the support of my hometown in Sandusky that really came together and donated so much, you know, like the, the coffin that Linda Evans uses was on lo loaned to us by the funeral home to the kid that I was like played little league with, you know, when I was seven years old or whatever. So like, um, I really felt like my hometown came out and sort of wrapped their arms around me and my cast and crew. And that is the only way that we were able to get the movie made because it was a pretty much a shoestring budget, to be honest. It all comes back full circle, all the people that you've known. Yeah. And, and uh, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah, no, it was amazing. It was really, uh, you need a lot of help, you know, when you're doing an independent film. You need extras, you need locations, you need, we literally had, we couldn't afford hotels, you know, so we, people donated rooms for my actors and cast and, and crew to stay in, you know. Um, but it was really magical because we were all kind of downtown and we were all together and uh, it, we had a lot of fun. We had tons of fun. It takes a village or more importantly, yeah. it takes a town. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, how did you decide on Udo Kier for the role of Mr. Pat? I mean... He was, was he already on your mind when you were working on the film or was it just like a perfect alignment? It was kind of a perfect alignment. Um, I didn't, um, I wasn't thinking of him when I, uh, when I wrote the film. Um, I actually had Gene Wilder in my head when I like, I had this fantasy that Gene Wilder was going to come out of retirement and do, and do the movie. Um, but um you know, that wasn't possible because he passed away, unfortunately. So we, we spent like a year and a half trying to cast uh, Pat. And the more, um, it's, an inter it's interesting because in Edge of 17, I wrote a Mr. Pat character for, in, for that, which wound up getting cut out of the film. It, because we could not, we literally could not find the right actor to play him, you know? And um, the role that Leah Delaria played uh, was much smaller originally. And so all of Pat's scenes like became Leah's scenes and her role was like much expanded. Um, so, which ended up working out great because she was amazing in the film. Um, but yeah, we spent like a year and a half casting Pat. And um, the, the more time that went on, the more I realized that I wanted to find someone that really uh, had experienced a lot of the things that the real Pat had gone through in terms of life experience and um, had lived through. Um, so one of my casting directors suggested Udo. I wish it was my idea, but it wasn't. Um, and uh, but right when she said it, it was like, oh, my God, you know, whoa, you know, because I had um, seen I think I first remembered Udo from Madonna's Deeper and Deeper video. And, um, you know, uh, I remembered the Andy Warhol, Dracula, Frankenstein, and I totally remembered him from um, one of my favorite queer films, My Own Private Idaho. Um, he's in that. And um, so I was like, whoa. So uh, we got the script to Udo and he really responded to it. And before I knew it, I was flying out to um, Palm Springs and, and hanging out with him and um, got to know him. And, and but, you know, uh, we became friends, which which was cool. So by the time we shot the movie, we had known each other for like a year. And um, that sort of friendship, I think, really helped in our collaboration, uh, creating, creating the character. But at this point, I do not, I just feel like there is literally no one on earth that could have played Pat other than Udo, you know? It just seemed like the role was made specifically for Udo. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. yeah. Um, you know, and of course, I have to ask this. What was it like working with the legendary Linda Evans and the iconic Jennifer Coolidge? Um, it was mind blowing. And um, starting with Jennifer, like I've just been absolutely obsessed with her since I think since um, American Pie, when she played Stifler's mom. And throughout all the Christopher Guest movies, um, best in show. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it just like, I, I like, I've like, she's like, I've worshiped her basically, you know? So she was my first choice to play the character of Dee Dee. And um, we tried to get a hold of her a million years ago. And being a small movie that can't like dangle tons of money in front of people, we could never get to her. We could never get her agent to take it seriously, you know, like they literally just didn't even tell her about it. Um, so at one point, uh, Jennifer got like a new manager. I was right about to cast somebody else, like at the very last minute, I thought, let's check one more time. Let's, let's, let's check back one more time. And it turned out Jennifer had a new manager. And so we got a hold of the manager and she was like, oh my God, Jen would love this. She would love this, you know? And of course she had never even, she didn't know anything about it up to that time. So we got her the script. Uh, I was on the phone with her, you know, which was like a dream come true to me. And we clicked and, um, and she came and did the film. And, you know, half of the stuff that she said is not in the script, you know, like she's a really, really brilliant um, improv, improver. And uh, so that that was the thrill. I wish that I wrote half the lines that she wound up saying, you know, cause they're so funny. And um, it was really awesome. She's been so supportive. Um, Linda Evans, oh my God. I mean, same thing. I, that was, um, you know, we brainstormed like who, I, I, I knew that I needed to be like a strong person to play the part of Rita. That's the person that Pat, goes to style um, her her hair when she's dead. And um, Linda, I've always loved Dynasty. And um, I remember Linda in Beach Blanket Bingo and like uh, Big Valley reruns. So um, reruns, I wanted to specify. I was, <laughs> yeah, but, um, but Linda, um, we got a hold of her and she really, the script really struck a chord with her, you know? Um, and I, I had forgotten when we made her the offer about the whole thing with her and Rock Hudson, um, that um, if you remember, like um, Rock Hudson was a guest star on Dynasty and they had like a, a sec like a kissing scene, a romantic scene where they kissed. And right after that came out, it came out, you know, that he had that he had AIDS and um, everybody went crazy. Oh, my God, did he give Linda AIDS and, you know, all this stuff. And she was so amazing. This is a million years ago. It's saying, no, you know, like, I'm not worried. That's not how you get it. Um, and, and she was so, she's just such an ally, you know? So I think maybe that's one of the reasons, and she's had so many people that she's lost to AIDS and, um, and uh, that she's known over the years. So she just really responded to, to the theme of the, of the, of the script. And, um, she is so nice. I mean, like, it's just crazy. She, uh, she's like one of the most genuine, nice people. And she's very small, which is weird because like, even on camera, it's like, she just looks so towering, you know, but she's just tiny, you know, but she's beautiful. She's, she still looks amazing. And um, Udo in particular loved working with her. Like he, he says that she was one of the most professional uh, actors he's ever worked with. So, um, yeah, we had so much fun. Larger than life. Yes, yes, yes. I heard I would throw a little dynasty here for you today. So. Oh yes. <laughs> Some crystals shimmering. Uh huh. <laughs> well, we do have a question um, from um, our people who are watching here. So Matthew has a question for you. Hi, Todd. Love ya, and congrats. Love you too. What's your process for selecting music for your films? Edge mm -hmm. of Seventeen and Swan Song are masterclass soundtracks. Mm, thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm very inspired by music. Like uh, that's what 
a lot of times I'll be listening to something and that's what gives me ideas. So um, back in the day, I would make like mixtapes, you know, when I wrote Edge of 17, I made like a mixtape of all the songs I remembered from the 80s that I loved and um, literally wrote a lot of the songs into the script, you know, same with Gypsy 83 with Stevie Nicks and The Cure. Um, so uh, I've just had and with um, Swan Song, it was like old school you know, old school, old school queen, old school, I don't know, old school glamour. Judy, we got Judy Garland song and Dusty Springfield and Shirley Bassey. And um, so I, I just, I am so inspired by music that it, it's just like what fuels, fuels me. And I'm also lucky enough to have an amazing music supervisor uh, named Jerry Gershman, who has the connections to the record companies and all that, who can, who, you know, can get the rights to these things. Cause that's not easy. You know, that's, that's a whole process. You know, it's crazy. You can't even play two seconds I, of a song without getting clocked for it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but the most amazing thing with Swan Song is getting Robin's song. You know, we got uh, Robin, who is one of my personal favorite performers, uh, her song Dancing on My Own which cleared literally the day before we shot the scene. So um, Udo had to le learn that one in a hurry, you know, but um, he did a brilliant job. And that, that scene is just makes me warm and tingly just thinking about it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Oh, that song wow. really strikes a chord with people. I don't know, you know? So uh, that, and that was my first choice uh, song, everything. Like I said before, I really felt like I had spirit. I was making a movie about the dead, you know, in a way. I mean, it's a comedy, <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's about a lot of people that Pat's not alive anymore. And so many people from that um, time are not with us anymore. And uh, I really felt like I was rousing their spirits. Like I felt them. And um, it, I don't know, just everything just kind of fell into place. And uh and that doesn't always happen. I've been on the other side of that too. You know what I mean? So just one of those that I felt like the, the spirits were on my side. And the entire soundtrack really does strike a chord with the emotions um, within the film. And you can, you can follow along that roller coaster quite well with the songs because we all know them um, yeah. for the most part. So we, we get it definitely. Yeah, and I and yeah, and I, the other thing is that um, the original score I had the um, pleasure and honor to work with my younger brother Chris, who did the original score, which also complements um, the the song so well and just adds so much emotion and heart to the film. So, yeah, that was that was a dream come true as well. I love music, and um, and I'm just so lucky that uh, the way it worked out. Well, you and me were making mixtapes back in the day, so there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question from Jean. Um, Jean is asking, is Swan Song your favorite film to work on in the trilogy? Uh, um, yes, I would say yes. Um, Edge of 17, I had a, there's a whole story involved in that, but I had a difficult time making that, that was tough. Um, it's tough to recreate your, to try to recreate your life, you know? Um, and um, that, that, was, that was intense um, to say the least. Gypsy 83 was wonderful, but um, that was incredible too. But uh, I would say, yeah, Swan Song was, I had the most fun. I mean, you know, we were all together and sort of living together. Udo was like downstairs from me and, um, you know, we, we're all, everybody was from all over and, and having like doing a movie on location like that versus like shooting in New York or LA where you're just like going to work and you go home every day. This way we were all together all the time. So we would rap and we would hang out, you know, and there's all these fabulous new bars and restaurants in my hometown that have, that's really having a resurgence. And, um, and we just became a real family, you know? So it's tough when it's over because, uh, you, you miss them, but, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll have a reunion someday. Yeah. It's some, it would have been probably here, you know, film festivals are usually a place where you have people come back together, you know, but obviously that's not happening yet, but um, 
the film is, uh, Swan Song is going to be released, um, you know, theatrically to tentatively later in the summer. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, to, cause we haven't like, I've never screened it with an audience. That's like a big, that's a big part of this is like, you work so long on these things, you know, for years and in so much, you know, I'm sure about performing, it's like, you, you get, that's when it's all worth it, <laughs> you know, like getting that response. Seeing your baby go up on the big screen is is the ultimate. Oh my God, it's amazing, yeah. And, and just having people come up and say that it moved them or that they saw themselves in it, that's like the highest honor to me as a filmmaker. Um, we have another question from Martin. Martin is asking, Sandusky is a different town than it was in the 90s. What was it like filming each film over the years in a city that particular? That's a great question. Um, interestingly enough, Sandusky has a long history of queer culture going back to like the 30s and 40s, I've heard, and I'm sure beyond, and before that, I'm sure. But um, in 97, when we shot Edge of 17, it was, it was definitely a different time. We, we decided to, um, to not tell people what the movie was really about, that it was not a, a gay storyline. And we actually changed you know, the name uh, of one of the leads, Rod to Rhonda, and created a fake script that we disseminated. Because we, like I said before, you need so much help you know, um, on a shoestring that we thought people wouldn't help us, you know? And, and it was, that was tougher back then, but cut, you know, Zoom 20 years later when I, when I got, went back home for, um, to start working on Swan Song, I, there were like all these, there was like a festival going on all these food trucks and balloons. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is going on? And they were like, oh, it's the third annual gay pride festival, you know? So, which just like, warmed my heart and blew my mind at the same time, you know, like, um, so yeah, my little hometown that was really kind of down and out, um, like, um, is really having a resurgence in part because it's being led by a bunch of really cool progressive people. And, um, and, uh, to the fact that they would have gay pride there now, I mean, it's just, it's still not perfect in a lot of ways, but, um, but it's come a long way in 20 years, you know? So that was interesting to see that as a frame, you know, like how, like 20 years later, what it was like to make a movie there to now, it's changed a ton. And ev like I said, everybody helped us. Everybody wanted to get involved. People knew Pat. Oh, Pat did my grandmother. You know, my, my mother went to Pat. My, I mean, it's like there was this love for this guy that still, vibrated you know in in the town so um that that really helped make it easier because people adored it their spirit was still living on yes absolutely i can feel it <laughs> yeah wonderful 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 well you know what i think uh this is about all the time we really have right this moment with you um you know i want to thank you again todd stevens um, for joining us tonight and congratulations um, again, for being the recipient of the SIF 45 Streams um, Dream Catcher Award. Thank you, Veranda. I'm honored and um, honored to talk to you. So, it was thank my you. pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you on the big screen. And come on back. I will. I'll be back soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll hand things over to our host for the second half of tonight's show. Thank you. Veranda, thank you. We need to have you moderating more festival programming. You are amazing. All right, and a special thanks to Karen Schiller from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center who will be interpreting for us for the rest of the evening. And we wanna take a moment as we transition into the second half of tonight's happy hour to thank all our guests and our audience for raising a glass with us. In my case, it's a bottle of Great Lakes Brewing Company Conway's Irish Ale. We would not be here without your ongoing support to bring film home. We do want to ask you to please consider contributing to our challenge match to support the future of our festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year, and we are grateful 
for any amount that you're able to give to donate, please visit clevelandfilm.org forward slash donate. Uh, we also want to invite you to join us, invite you to join us for our SIFS film trivia tonight, trivia night presented by Pierre's Ice Cream. You can win passes to SIF 46 in 2022. Uh, teams of up to six people should email our virtual events manager, Hannah at Hannah at clevelandfilm.org. And you see Hannah has two H's there by no later than 12 noon Eastern time on April 18th. Uh, with their team name and a list of team members. The event will take place that night, again, Sunday, April 18th at 7 o'clock. Uh, and if you don't have a team, not to worry, you can try your luck at one of our communal team tables or hang solo at group if groups are not your thing. Visit clevelandfilm.org forward slash trivia night for more details. And now we'll head into the second segment tonight, led by Dr. Lady J. Director of Programming, Education, and Outreach for Studio West 117, and the world's first drag queen with a PhD dissertation on drag history, which makes Dr. Lady J the best person to possibly lead this conversation uh, uh, about a documentary about drag history. So please welcome Dr. Lady J. Thank you so much, Patrick. I'm Dr. Lady J. I am a drag historian. I've been doing that for about 10 years now. I wrote my dissertation on uh, the mainstreaming of drag in the 1990s. You can find that with its over 4,000 downloads on my website at theonlyladyj.com. And I'm the director of programming, education, and outreach here at Studio West 117. And I'd like to introduce our special guests from the incredible film, P.S. Burn This Letter, Please. First up, we have Jennifer Teixeira, who is the director and producer. We also have Michael Seligman, who is the director, producer, and editor. And we have Craig Olson, who is a producer. And finally, and I am so excited, we also have George Roth, also known as Rita George, as a performer back then. Uh, who is also joining us with one of the main subjects of the film. Thank you all so much. I am so incredibly excited to speak with all of you. Um, I guess the first thing I just want to start off with is, as a drag historian and a performer, um, I just want to say thank you first to Jennifer, Craig, and Michael for this incredible contribution to drag history. This is truly brings to life things that we've had snippets and pieces of before, but we've never really seen something like this that's so fully fleshed out and so beautiful before. And I also wanna say a special thank you and single you out, George, for paving the way for all of us performers for the, for the rest of time. Like what you all did is so important and it is the reason why I do what I do as a drag historian. So just thank you so much. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. You're so welcome. Mm -hmm. So the first question I have is, you know, obviously this movie came about, this documentary came about from a trove of these letters that were found. So once those were found, or I guess part of what I want to ask is how were those found? Um, but how did the whole film come to be? How did it go from a discovery in a, you know, in a storage unit to this incredible a uh, documentary of interwoven personal narrative and history and all of this. Well, I guess I'll start. Uh, uh, I, I discovered the letters back in 2014 and they indeed came out of a storage unit. Uh, and they came out of a storage unit from a very Hollywood famous person who had passed. And uh, when I first opened up this box and, and saw these letters. They were dated back to the early 1950s up into the 60s. And they were a group of friends writing these letters to a man named Reno Martin. And I had no idea who Reno Martin was. And I started reading these letters and I thought, these are really juicy letters. I, I feel like I should not be reading them. They're, they're very personal. And upon reading them, I realized, wait a minute, these are drag queens that are writing these letters. They're talking about what they're wearing, where they're going, what the clubs are they're going to, getting arrested. It was absolutely insane. And I 
And I immediately called Michael Seligman, who's one of my dear friends, and I said, you got to get over here. you got to see what I just found. This is absolutely incredible. I love the art of drag. I do drag. And it was like, I think if anybody else would have found these letters, I think they would have gone into the, into the trash. And Michael came over and we toiled over these letters and we thought that they were like so, so much more interesting than just reading them around a dinner table that we enlisted Richard Konigsberg, who is the executive producer on this film, who is also the owner and the keeper of these letters, and you have to watch the movie to find out why. Um, and we convinced him that we have to do a documentary. You know, we convinced him then he had to pay for it. <laughs> so he was really instrumental in helping. But when Michael came over that day, we knew we had something special. And Michael, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah. So, you know, so Craig called me and, uh, you know, we, we've started looking through these letters and there are so many. I mean, there's almost, I think, 200 letters in total. And they are this very specific window into a time and place that neither one of us had ever known about. You know, they, they it was a New York City gay, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, group of people, uh, at, you know, at, at a time when, you know, we thought everybody was, you know, like pre-Stonewall, everybody was ashamed in the closet, hiding, uh, alcoholic, you know, living horrible, terrible lives because that's what we had been taught. And then you, you see these letters and it was just this window into this um, you know, t time and place, like I say, and, and, and the letters are so sort of joyful and jubilant and the people that are writing them are very well adjusted and they're not ashamed and they're not hiding and they're not embarrassed. They're just living their lives knowing that there are kind of, you know, uh, parameters to how, the, how far they can go. And so, you know, little by little just started doing research and putting things together and reaching out. And then, you know, um, got connected with Jen. I'd never made a movie before and got connected to Jen. And, and we just had this amazing, um, you know, vision for how to do, do this. And really that's when things like went to the next level. Yeah, this is just such an incredible story. And I am just so incredibly grateful that this exists. I have to tell you, I've already watched the movie three times. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I like I and I can't wait to share this in drag history classes and talks with people um, with available to the public later on because this is just outstanding. Uh -huh. um, so one of the other questions I have that I'm super curious about is and I'd love to ask George first and then refer it to everyone else, which is like, George, how did you feel when they came to you or what was your reaction when they proposed any of this to you and then uh, also to the rest of you? Um, you know, what, what was it like contacting this performance? <laughs> well, actually it was really sort of crazy because when they started telling me about some of these people and what they were doing, I realized I knew some of these people and I had contact with them. In fact, one person that's in the film uh, that had the big balls, uh, Daisy D, I knew <laughs> Daisy from going to the balls and but I never knew him as a guy. And he never knew me as George. It was always Daisy D. or Rita. And so, I mean, it was like opening another page for me and enlightening me to more of what I was doing, but we were just doing it because it was fun. Uh, I worked at a nightclub and uh, it was very acceptable. I had been doing it since I was in grammar school. I mean, <laughs> there was nothing to do me to, to be doing this. And I, I've been very fortunate in so far as not having, knock on wood, never had any trouble in my life doing drag, being in drag. Uh, it, it's just, I, I guess I've been blessed. But knowing, seeing some of these letters, from some of these people and realizing that I knew some of them, it was like connecting the dots. Because actually they were referred to me from somebody from the 82 Club that I did not know, but knew I worked at the 82 Club which was a large uh, club in New York, which was a female impersonators that had been running for years. And uh, it was just crazy to find out that a lot of these things were going on and I was going to places and doing things that now all of a sudden were becoming historic. 
This is so incredible. I mean, George, I have to tell you, just like, it's so exciting just to speak to, to you at all. Like, you know, so many people, even if I have a concept when I'm looking at a page sometimes of like, maybe there's a person still out there. There's no concept that I'd ever be able to actually like put a name to a face, speak to a person. Like, um, just from to satisfy my own curiosity, what, like, when were you at Club 82? So when would I have been? Uh, the entire 60s. I moved to New York like in uh, 59, 60, right out of God, when I got out of college. And uh, prior to that, I had always been going to Fire Island. And so I, I was there for the real heyday. And uh, we would go to the, the balls in Brooklyn when we were allowed to, actually, because we weren't supposed to miss a show unless we had permission. And uh, I worked with some of the, the classic people now I realize, but then they were just other performers that I worked with. You know, Titanic, Jackie May, uh, Kit Russell, uh, Kim. Oh my Mark, God, yeah. these, I mean, I, I was in shows with all these people, but they were just friends. I mean, we'd go to parties, we'd get a night, and Brandy Alexander would say, we've been invited to a party, wear silver, and I went, oh God, not Andy again. But I mean, and then it was just fun, it was fun times. And who knew then, it means so much now. Oh my God, yeah, it's incredible. And just hearing like that it was just kind of banal and every day for you to be working with someone like Jackie May, like the, these, these names are names that I'm very aware of. And like, like I said, this is, this is so incredible to me. Um, so that token, I, I do want to still talk to everybody else. Still. Um, so what, what was you all's experience of approaching performers um, to actually talk to folks. Like, I, I know sometimes folks can be really resistant or reluctant to share their stories or, or not sure what, what the hell you're doing with them. Well, it was interesting, you know, because uh, it was a dream of mine and Michael's. Uh, there's some very prominent subjects in the, in the letters, there's some people. There's this one character named Daphne and whose letters were so rich and so funny. Like she's reading other queens at some ball. It's like the first read in history, I swear to God. And we really wanted to find Daphne and, if, and you know, we thought to ourselves, we'd be lucky if we found any of them because hopefully they survived the AIDS crisis, yeah. you know? And uh, when Michael found Daphne, and this was literally about two years into the project, everything changed. And it was like knocking on his door and, uh, you know, just getting him. He thought nobody would be interested in him. He was like in his early, late 80s, early 90s, nobody would be interested in him. Why would, why would we come to him? He didn't want to do it at first. And even when we got him to do it, we got to New York and he's like, we're going to shoot him the next day. And he's like, I can't do it, guys. You know, this happened in my past and there's things I'm ashamed of. And I was just like, I was like, Michael, his name is Michael, Michael alone. And I said, I understand everything you're saying, but I am so touched by your letters and I do believe with everything I have in my heart that this will change other people's lives and give them an insight onto who you were and so we can understand and be educated. I said, I promise you with everything I have in my heart, everything in my being, I will make you look good and will tell your story. And he's like, he looked at my face and he goes, your face is so symmetrical, I'll do it. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, get the get, roll the camera. And uh, Michael was so great and just interviewing him and talking him through. And he became such a blessed family member to me. And, uh, and just the things that he could recall from a, the childhood or coming out to his father and the things that his father told him, it was just like we would, just, Michael and I would just look at each other off camera like, this is, this is, this is everything. You know, and it, we realize the importance of telling these stories. And it was like that with a lot of people. Michael, you can share more on that. Jen. Oh, mm -hmm. Jen, Jen. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a quite a long journey. I mean, we have nine queens, one of which is George, featured in the film. Uh, each of them were a complete, incredible journey to try to locate. We actually enlisted the help of a private eye to help us. Um, only because we only had drag names and maybe an address, maybe a birthday. And then a lot of it, as George was saying, was word of mouth, you know, like, oh, well, I know so-and-so is alive, you know? So, um, and with a lot of our queens, they don't have cell phones. Um, 
George has one, but uh, you know, it was landlines and they didn't have email. And so it was just a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of persistence. Uh, I think each of them were hesitant, you know, I mean, I mean, even George, when we first spoke, you were like, who are you? What do you want? I don't know. You know, like everyone was just like, you, you know, this is crazy. Um, some were a lot more reluctant to speak than others. I think that, um, you know, this was something that a lot of them had packed away a long time ago and we were bringing up names and experiences, uh, that were, you know, quite personal and the head, you know, that were happened a really, really long time ago. So that, that journey was quite beautiful. So a lot of times we would show up without even, um, the invitation to shoot and we just would hang out. Um, and, uh, and, and eventually we would get to get to, you know, sit down with the camera. But I think that that, um, I think that that kind of paid off for us at the end because the the film is very intimate and as Craig said they they are a family so I love this I mean this is this is just such I can't get over like what a contribution this is because you yeah. know there's still so much history always left to be recovered 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 you know we're still not in a place um, where we have what the what visual art has or what sculpture has or what a theater has where we have like a very clear history and a very clear narrative that then we can mess with. Mm -hmm. We're kind of still in a place where we're still building the single line that we can critique afterwards. Yeah, and I think that like as as you know queer people, it's like having to start from square, every generation has to start from square one because there is no record, you know? And and um, what's uh, amazing, you know, and, and maybe I'm sure that you're aware of this, but, but what's amazing is, you know, how much drag culture has stayed intact. And, you know, the drag queens of today are not that different from the drag queens of, you know, the 1950s, a lot of the lingo is the same, you know, talking about mopping or talking about painting or like certain, um, you know, sort of phrases that drag queens used then and now. And that has, you know, gone from generation to generation without being written down. There's no manual, there's no book, there's no history, um, you know. And so what's really wonderful about these letters and about our, our ability to, to have, you know, caught all of these people, uh, you know, in our film, like George and all the others, um, is that we were able to like capture their, um, this history for future generations, you know, so they don't have to start over again. Absolutely. And there's one thing I really wanted to just personally, like, say also thank you for, because one of the things that I'm a trans woman when I'm out of drag, and one of the things that I don't see, period, <laughs> is... You know, I, I've been doing talks about the place of trans women in drag history for a long time. But when you see histories presented, even if there are trans women who are presented as part of the story, there is no follow up. It's, it's almost impossible because then you have changes of name, uh, legal name, in addition to the changes in drag name and all of this. And a lot of people just kind of go off and live a life. And seeing Terry in the movie, I will tell you, moved me to tears. Um, very much so. Like I wasn't expecting that, and it's it makes me emotional talking about it now. Um, mm -hmm. It's part of the reason I've watched the movie three times because I can't get over, like you said, when you talk about how our experience doesn't differ from theirs so much. That whole, you know, it's very personal, but like that whole thing that Terry talks about about having to fight that self hatred and self loathing, like that is very much my experience. And like hearing someone who is has some experience similar to mine who's in the 80s speak to that is um, to say it's rare would be an understatement. Um, so like that, I wanted to just say like kudos uh, to you all because that that's gonna mean a lot to a lot of people. Um, and it certainly meant a lot to me. So George, you should re relay that to her. George is actually really good friends with Terry and is the reason why Terry is part of our film. So well, I would love, yeah. I would love to have any kind of contact. Um, yeah, you should definitely 
tell her that, um, how, like, we, we always let her know how much uh, her story means. I mean, just the fact that, I mean, she transitioned in 1961. I mean, yeah. mind blowing, mind blowing. But um, uh, yeah, and that she was brave enough to share that experience with us. But yeah, we owe that all to George. They're very good friends. Yeah, thank you for that, George. Because, uh, like I said, it's I come from a, I come from two different drag families. Uh, one of my drag moms is a trans woman. One is not, and that's been a huge part of of who I am as a performer and all of that. But it just really meant uh, uh, the world to me um, to see Terry in, in there. In addition to everything else, and I I wanted to uh, before I move to some audience questions. I wanted to also say one of the things I really loved about the film in terms of editing and storytelling was the way that, okay, so we have the story of the Queens at Club 82, but we also layered in the story about the butch lesbians, about Phil Blackball in Harlem um, and Gladys Bentley and like all these kind of things. And uh, I'm wondering how, how you went about putting, creating a narrative out of all well, Jen is a genius uh, storyteller and she is so remarkable. And I'm just going to build her up for one second before she talks. But, um, you know, when, you know, we were sort of had all of this work that we'd done, uh, you know, sort of foundational work, but it was really when Jen came on board that the whole film went to the next level and, and she brought all of her years of experience to make it what it is. And I think that's a big reason why it, why it's so wonderful. So Jen, you can go from there. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, no, I think it was really important. I mean, obviously we had a beautiful wealth of knowledge. You know, our, our, uh, footage and, and stories to tell. And it was kind of, you know, when we were trying to choose the narrative, um, you know, I think as a filmmaker, you want to look at the stories that have been told and told amazingly. You know, we, we knew that, um, you know, how, how to survive a plague existed. We knew that the queen existed. We knew that Paris has, was um, is burning existed. So we knew that there was these amazing films that had already done their job so well, and what we were missing, not only from a historical context, was this time in the 1950s and early 60s. And so we really quickly said, let's just focus on this time. There's nothing. We can't find anything. And if we can find these people to reconstruct that history for us, then there's something, you know, that hasn't been done before. I think that, um, you know, one of my mottos is inclusion and diversity. Obviously the opening of the film is Michael uh, Henry Adams, who says it so eloquently, you know, that um, as black people, and as brown people, and as, as gay people, um, you know, it's really hard to find our history unless we, you know, tell it ourselves more or less. Um, so that's what we wanted to make sure that we were very inclusive. If we were going to tell the story of the 50s, we wanted to bring in as many voices as we possibly could in that 90 minute constraint. So I think that, you know, these those other groups were so much a part of this scene and so much a part of that time. I just wish we had, I mean, the next documentary is the the is Harlem. I mean, that needs to be a documentary. I would that I I always say that's my next dream documentary because the Harlem Renaissance and what was happening in the LGBTQ community back then was so remarkable. Um, and and same and same with the the butch lesbians at the eighty two. Um, you know, I'm going to sing Michael's praises. He did an incredible podcast called Mob Queens that followed Anna Genovese, who was the mob boss, and who George was a part of that as well. Um, but you know, she had a relationship with one of those butch lesbians and was bisexual herself. So, you know, all this digging and all these worlds, I think it was really important to, you know, include as much as we could. Yeah, I'm super excited. And I will say I did already cheat and watch, listen to the whole Mob Queens podcast. So, <laughs> yes. Thank I'm you. always like, I'm tracking every step that's happening at all times. If I can get Amazing. my house. So um, thank you all so much. Um, I have one question from the audience real quick from Anne Marie. Uh, she says, excellent film. Can you please tell us about the search for Charlie? Did the other performers you interviewed know her? Yeah, Charlie was really a challenge um, because we had so little information to go off of. And Charlie, um, um, 
was sort of connected to the New York City girls, but lived in Mount Vernon. Um, and so was kind of like part of another circle. So there were like a little overlap there, but um, yeah, we tried I like every which way. And, and you know, as, as Jen alluded to, you know, it's like these letters, you know, nobody signed their, most of the people didn't sign their register. I think Charlie was Charlie's real name, but they didn't put last names. They didn't put a lot of identifying um, information in the letters because it, they were talking about really personal things about drag, about sex, about gay things, you know? And I think they just wanted to have maybe plausible deniability if somebody found that letter and said, wait a minute, like, is this you? And, and you know, so it was to sort of save themselves from being outed. But, um, you know, there is that one, bit of a, a letter in the film that just broke my heart every time um, where he says, you know, his best friend who was, was another letter writer who's not in the film, but you know, his, his family didn't want him hanging around Charlie because Charlie looked like a girl. And that was just really hard. That is really heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, okay. So next question from the audience, uh, where are the letters now from Lawrence? And is there a drag museum somewhere? There should be. <laughs> well, uh, the letters are in my safety deposit box <laughs> in Beverly Hills, uh, and they're historical, and they will definitely, I promise you with everything I have, that they will be in a museum someday so that the world can see these letters and read these letters, and possibly a companion piece would be a wonderful book uh, with these letters so that people can read them and, and uh, and because if you read these letters, it will change your life. It really, really will. Please make that book a reality. I will be first in line and I will publicize the living <laughs> We'll keep you posted, yeah. Okay. Um, so other question from Jean. Do you feel this film will encourage more queens to document their lives and preserve history? I mean, George, that would be a dream. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, George? Oh, definitely. I mean, well, as you all know, I didn't realize the treasure trove that I had until you all had me start digging. <laughs> it was like, oh, God. I mean, and when you followed me up to Fire Island for my 40th anniversary of being Miss Fire Island, it was uh, something that I knew I was going to do. I didn't know that it was going to be that important to anybody else, truthfully, except maybe a few of my friends, you know. But, I mean, right. they, they made it monumental as far as I'm concerned, because it was uh, just a fun thing. And it, it was fun for me to include some of my drag queen friends from Fire Island in New York, along with me in the film. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, it's important that, uh, you know, this history is, is potentially out there, more stories like this, you know, and I think it's important to talk to our elders and talk to our, you know, neighbors and friends and, and look in the attics, you know, and look in the, you know, like George says, like when we were just going through all his old pictures and starting to recognize, oh my God, that's Anna Genovese in this photograph. That's so-and-so in this photograph. Oh my gosh, that's this, you know, this history is, is there in various forms. And, you know, it's up to us to really do our part to preserve it as much as possible for ourselves. Um, Cause making this movie meant so much to us as queer people, like realizing that we have such a wonderful history that hadn't been fully explored before. And, um, you know, to, to be able to document this and preserve it for future generations. Um, and, and so like, please go look in attics, in basements, um, talk to people, talk to people. And every baby queen out there, when you meet <laughs> older queens who still, when they pull out their stuff, stop and be like, hey, where's that going when something yeah. happens to you? Yes. Where does it go? Because that's one of the biggest questions is so many things just go in a dumpster. Yep. You know, yes. people, that's the biggest thing people don't realize about LGBTQ history is just so many things just, there's nobody to pass it on to, or there's mm -hmm. shame about passing it on, and so right, things yeah. just are gone. Yeah. So encourage yeah. the people you know, free Facebook and social media times, keep everything, store it, and give it to someone. 
Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's so important because we need to preserve education or we need to be educated. Okay, okay so, so about the wait, LGBT. Uh, I just wanted to say down here in New Orleans, because we have a history of the gay balls that have been going on for many, many years, we have a really complete history of things all the way back to the late 50s and early 60s. And we do have two communities, actually the local museum here actually had a gay carnival history exhibition that ran for almost a year. And it had a lot of, a lot. in fact, one of the places that were doing a, a photo exhibition, I walked in and saw a picture of myself that I had never seen before. <laughs> you don't even know who had pictures of you or other people that you know, that you recognize. And, and somebody putting them together, you know, Craig and, and, and Jen and Michael have done is very, very important, and it sort of starts the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. the, the, drag the, rolling. Drag ball rolling. the drag ball rolling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I can't even imagine how surreal it must be to see photos of yourself from back in the day where you're like, that you don't necessarily remember taking. Yeah, <laughs> no, and exactly. I mean, there, there was that one moment in the film where Claude, you know, um, is describing uh, getting Daphne into drag and describes it in this exquisite detail. And Jen and I, you know, are sitting there listening to him talk and talk and 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 tell all the details about the wig and the the way the dress was made and where there was a slit in the leg with a zipper and and how the crowd reacted and we're looking at each other like we have a photograph of exactly what he is speaking about and there's that really brilliant moment in the film where Jen hands um, Claude the photograph and he just breaks down you know he hadn't seen that in sixty some odd years. I love that. I love, that's one of the things I loved seeing in this movie was the emotional reaction from the performers to yeah. seeing and being reminded of what was in these letters and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, that. That was so incredible. So um, I think that's probably, I don't want to keep everybody past their time. Uh, so <laughs> We can I, talk all night. I can talk all night. <laughs> I want to say thank you to all of you. Like this has been, absolutely incredible and an, a real treat for me personally um george if there is any way for us to get in contact after this i would love to speak with you and terry um so uh well, I'm, 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 on, I'm on facebook and i'm like uh i'm more public than i realize because so <laughs> oh, i think I, we would love to have you here at west 117 foundation sometime we're gonna be doing all kinds of events and I'm gonna be hosting all kinds of things on drag history. And I really wanna get more elders like yes. and doing the thing for as long as they've been around up in here, like sharing your stories with everyone. So I definitely wanna stay in contact as much as possible. So um, that said, uh, that's unfortunately all the time we have for this evening. I do want to thank you, say thank you again to all of our guests for the incredible film. P.S. Burn this letter, please. If you have not seen it yet, please go get yourself one of the tickets in the festival. You will regret it uh, if you do not, because <laughs> it's really, truly one of the most incredible pieces of history I've seen in a long time. And um, I just want to let you all say your your goodbyes as well. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much and enjoy Bye. the film. Thank you, Dr. Lady J. We really appreciate yeah. you taking it. Thank you time. so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lady J. I'm sure we'll meet again soon. I should, I absolutely hope so. Uh, feel free to reach out to me any old time. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, thank you again to Great Lakes Brewing Company for sponsoring our fabulous happy hours. And tune in tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern time for another live CIFF 45 streams happy hour. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, keep watching films, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.